Good evening. Maybe we'll get uh, started here. Um, thanks for coming out tonight on this chilly evening. Um, I want to welcome you to the first episode of The Leading Edge. We're very excited to be here. My name's Tom Hayes. I'm the department head for genetics, cell biology, and development. And as I say, we're really um, enthusiastic about this opportunity to expand our interactions beyond just our own colleagues and reach out to the public and local students to enjoy talking about topical topics in the area of biomedical and, and biological sciences. So before I go any further, I wanted to take just a second to um, call out Lisa Chen. Lisa Chen over here. Professor Chen is actually the... <laughs> The leading edge was the brainchild of uh, Dr. Chen over there, and it's through her efforts that she's put together this three series and will allude to the other uh, talks that are coming later in the month. Um, by her side was Jessica Stewart, providing admin and logistic support, Jessica. <laughs> so really, this is basically their production. So. Um, as most of you probably already have an idea of what the Department of Genetic Cell Biology and Development does, but just to give you a, a snapshot, it's most, most of our research spans um, interest in areas of cellular structures or molecular processes in cells, in living cells, that end up impacting the function, development, reproduction of living organisms. And for the most part, those of us who um, are taking this uh, basic science approach, our faculty and postdocs and their graduate students spend a lot of time holed up in their labs, working very hard in the weeds, some might say, trying to understand how any one of those molecular processes works inside a cell. And I think the interesting point that we always try to bring across to our students is the fact that out of those basic science fundamental studies, comes discoveries that are basically the underpinning of the following translational work that ends up directly benefiting society. And so as, as researchers, we're basically in the lab working, trying to understand those processes with the goal of trying to impact society. And then as educators, that is basically the primary thing we try to bring across to our students is that that simple but critical link between basic science, fundamental science, and translational science, and things that benefit society. So basically, basic science is the pipeline to the benefits that come to society from translational research. So tonight's conversation, Meet Your Genes, is a really good example of that, in that it's highlighting how fundamental advances in DNA sequencing and technologies and genomic researches, research are providing new insights into genetic, genetic variation of individuals, how that um, reflects risk in terms of disease, and then how genetic tests can help us understand who's at risk and who's not. So the first speaker will be Heather Zerhut, except she won't have a pointer because it just fell apart. <laughs> Heather is um, about to be promoted to associate professor in the department. She's an associate director of the genetic counseling graduate program, and her research is focused on the genetic screening programs, implementations of genetic testing into primary care, and access to genetic counseling in diverse communities to decrease genetics-related health care disparities. Dr. Zerhut is an active member of the National Society of Genetic Counseling and currently serves on the board of directors. She's been recognized by her peers as the recipient of the Outstanding Volunteer and Strategic Leaders Award. So she's going to speak first, and then Bonnie's going to directly follow her. Bonnie Leroy is a professor in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology, and Development. She's the director of our graduate program in genetic counseling, and I might add is really one of the flagships of our department. Um, 
Bonnie is an associate member of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota. She's also a member of the Academy of Distinguished Teaching Professors at the University of Minnesota, and she is a past president of the National Society of Genetic Counselors and the American Board of Genetic Counseling. She completed two terms as the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Genetic Counseling from 2008 to 2017. So I want to thank you again for all coming tonight, um, and I'll turn at this point the podium over to Heather. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I have to say that I've given a lot of talks um, on this topic and others, and I think this is a re really unique opportunity to have students, faculty, community members, alumni all in a room together. And so thank you, this is really a great opportunity. Um, we're gonna try to save time at the end for a lot of opportunity for questions and discussion. So if I am a little brief um, and I go a little quickly, that's why. Um, so please, we would love to hear your questions, but we'll just save them till the end. Great. All right. So we're talking today about direct-to-consumer testing. So specifically those tests that you saw maybe advertised over the holidays, um, the ones that pop up on your Amazon or your advertising when you're looking at Facebook, um, and the ones that might um, be on those stores at Target. So this is an advertisement that you see that I collected over the holidays. The Grinch's results are in. I'm pretty sure that's not true. I'm pretty sure that the Grinch doesn't maybe have DNA that's being tested in one of these laboratories, but it's cute and clever. It might pull you in. Uh, this is a screenshot that says you're totally my genotype. And if you know anything about genetics, that's probably maybe not a good thing. Um, say it with saliva. How romantic is that? Um, and if you prefer other holidays like uh, St. Patrick's Day, kiss me, I'm exactly 63% Irish. So uh, these, are, these are fun, right? They're recreational in nature. Um, and they also have some interesting implications. So today we're going to talk about some high level uh, facts about these tests, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty or the fine print, the things that you might have clicked quickly through when you were consenting to do this testing, because that's where some of the really interesting um, parts are. So as we think about these tests, um, there are several main functions. The first is to look in the past. So thinking about ancestry, whether that's a couple hundred years ago or a couple thousand years ago. Thinking about the present. Maybe you're adopted. Maybe you're looking for family. And also the future. How does this information potentially impact our health? So I'd like to get a little bit of a reading in this room. How many people have ha done a recreational genomic test? So I'd say that's maybe 30%. How many of you that did those tests did them for ancestry? How many of you, those people did them for health? So it's like half and half, I would say, of that. Um, and how many of you, has anyone done clinical genetic testing? Okay. So there is, and those were different people, which I think is interesting. Maybe some of them had the same. So there's lots of different reasons, and there's a lot of people that are doing this testing. So 20 million people are estimated to have done a consumer genomic test. So that's about 6% of the U.S. population. So that is not insignificant. So we probably have a slightly more than average percentage in this room. Um, when we think about the testing, what actually happens? So you literally spit into a tube. So <laughs> the, it's a lot of spit, too. Anyone that's done it knows it can take some effort. Um, so you, you basically collect it, the saliva, which is taking the cells from the parts of the, the roof of your mouth or, the, or your, um, your, your, your saliva. Um, in, in, in there is the cells. And if we go back to our biology, we started from sperm and egg, to, and we came together into one cell, and miraculously, Somehow all of our genetic information is packaged into these things called chromosomes that just look like squiggly worms to me. And you somehow turn into a human. So the DNA is this instructions. And it's the instructions that are three billion, you could say genetic letters or genetic numbers, code, sequence, whatever you want to call it. And when we do genetic testing, basically what we do is we take that DNA and we try to identify the different pieces. 
And one way that we can do it is by making it fluoresce or make it be a color. And so what these testing companies can do is they can take your DNA and they can make it one color. And then they can take control DNA that they know the sequence of and they know what it is and they make it another color. And then they use this technology um, to basically glue it onto the, what we call a chip. So as I said, we all have about three billion of these DNA letters. And many of these chips only have about one million spots where they can stick your DNA. Which means that if you're thinking about a book and you can take this down to say a 3,000 page book, there's maybe only one page where you're getting that information. So can you see the whole genomic story? Probably not. If those specific pieces of the book are in very specific spots, could you maybe get a plot? Maybe. And if you were really strategic about those, could you maybe get some really important information? So you could. So when we look at kind of what this chip looks like after the DNA is stuck to it, this would say, for instance, if you look at the rows, that could be one person's information. And then the columns are the various different individual pieces and places within the genome. And what these chips can do then is we can look at the pattern. So if you look at the different colors, you can see that maybe if in this first sequence, there's a couple of those reds, but they look more similar than potentially different. And then we can compare these sequences to different populations, where they're from, and we can see what do those patterns look like when we compare it to these different control populations. So for instance, this pattern might look like Eastern European, but another part pattern could be Korean. Are you guys following me? Great. So this is what it actually looks like when you get back your results from, say, one of these companies. Um, so you look at mine, and 55% is French and German. And they can actually show where on those chromosomes, those squiggly worm-looking structures, um, my parts of my genome are from these different geographic regions. Now, I am fortunate to have a pretty rich history in my family where we actually know, going back several hundred years, where my ancestors are from. So this is my great-great-grandfather's home where he was a carpenter, and that's my great-great-grandmother's sister. So I kind of have an ability to fact-check these tests. So I know I'm Swiss, I know I'm German, I know I'm Croatian, I know I'm Slovenian, so I think they did a pretty good job, right? But there's still some questions, so this doesn't actually, this one reaches 100%. Um, but some of the companies don't actually get to 100%, and you see some of them say broadly European and broadly Southern. So this is another test. Looks quite different, right? So which one do I believe? This shows you how some of the geographic regions have been defined by those different controls that we talked about. Um, and so I have a friend who um, is adopted. She was adopted from Korea, and when she did her test, it said she's 100% Korean. Didn't help her learn much. <laughs> um, so if you look at, say, for instance, the whole continent of Africa, you know, this several companies might have, say, five different ways. And those are very large areas and very diverse populations. So what if we take two individuals that have identical DNA because they are identical twins? What do we think these companies might say then? What if we compared them? So these, this is exactly what two twins, one was a reporter, did. And what you see is, again, these companies are slightly different. But even within identical twins, the results are not exactly the same. So why could this be? Well, there's technical reasons. So these tests, with any type of test, you know that there can be things like human errors, there can be technical issues. Even if this test is 99.9% .9 accurate, that means that 0.1% of the time, or in those million different little pieces that we're looking at, a thousand times there's, there's going to be an error. And if those errors are in critical regions, that could make calls be different, right? Um, so there's also funky genetic reasons why they could be different. And even identical twins, they have different changes that happen new in new people that can lead to those changes. So this can lead to differences in calls as well. 
It also depends when in time we're talking about our ancestry. How many, again, hundreds of years or thousands of years back are we going? Because we all originated here. Now, some companies will tell you about your genius matches. These are not my genius matches, by the way. Um, some will tell you your percentage of Nathandersol DNA. I'm first place out of one because I didn't connect with family or friends via this test. So again, how you look at the interpretation of some of these results depends on controls and what information they have. Another common function of these tests is connecting the percentage of DNA. So we, again, we showed you how they looked at the big chunks of DNA. What percentage of those are you related to someone else that's in their database? Is it 50% a first degree relative or 25% a second degree? And then also, um, if we look at those different regions, um, we can think about, OK, well, this is a relative that's in California. Do I want to maybe reach out to that relative that I don't know? So you can create connections. This is, can be opted into in some companies and then needs to be opted out in others. Some of the first early adopters of this technology were people that were adopted. This is um, a fantastic genetic counselor here at M Health Fairview, Hee Wan Lee, who did her research project looking at adoptees. And not surprisingly, 83% of them were using this to reach out to biological family members. And a point here is whoever's in your database, the more people creates the more connections, which creates more data, which creates more accuracy. So there are, each of these databases is different. Other information you can hear is wellness. This is kind of a catchy word, right? Of course I want to be healthy. Of course I likely consume more caffeine than I needed. Um, my partner would tell you I don't uh, deeply sleep um, and that I do move around in my sleep, which are also types of things that they can look at. Um, and uh, Bonnie particularly likes the, this one. I have a common elite power gene. Don't <laughs> think that's true. The other thing is they ask you a lot of questions. They're doing a lot of research. So how much of this survey day is contributing it and how much of my genetic information is actually contributing? This is one of my favorites, hair curliness. So based upon this result, 11% chance of curly and 89% chance of straight or wavy. As of 2012, you may agree with this. If you knew me before this time, you would disagree with this. <laughs> I couldn't get those ringlets anymore even if I tried and used thousands of gallons of product. Um, and this might have to do with hormones. It could have to do with stress. So a lot of these phenotypes are also implemented or impacted by the environment and how much of a role is environment playing in some of these factors. Especially this is important when we think about complex health conditions. Here is an example of one of those, age-related macular degeneration. Fairly common condition leading to blindness. When I would see this result, or anyone would see this result, first of all, think about for yourself. If you saw two variants detected, what would that mean to you? So I saw some, I don't know. Right, I don't know. <laughs> so that's what I thought too. I'm like, okay, it says I'm at slightly increased risk. What does slightly increased mean? I don't know. Um, is this autosomal dominant? Meaning, does this have a 50% chance? Is this going to cause it? Do I need both of these genetic changes to have the disease? Do they work together? Because if I have two, does that mean it's worse, right? So all of these things matter and are specific to the conditions we're, we're talking about. So frequency matters. How common are these variants? If I took a scan of this room, um, based upon an ethnic background that was European, about 60%, or African-American, about 60% of us would have this genetic change. And 40% of us would have that other one. So again, the majority of people would actually get this result, which is good for a company if you're trying to give out genetic testing results, right? But what is the magnitude? What does that slightly actually mean? So it means that there's a 1.24, a one and quarter increased chance of getting this condition. So then you have to think, well, what's the likelihood of this happening in the general population? Well, let's just say it's at like about 2 to 3%. So that's less than 1% increase. Does that matter to me? 
it's a question. It really is a valid question. What does this information mean to me? So in my research, I study a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, which leads to a genetic form of high cholesterol. One in 250 people have it, which is relatively common for a genetic condition, and it's treatable. So you would actually screen children for this condition, and they can start treatment early. It prevents them from having over a 50% chance of having a cardiac event before the age of 50 or 60. It's significant. So there's four genes involved in this condition that we know of, many other genes that contribute to it, but for simplification factor, I'm gonna focus on these four. Um, ABOB is one example, and if we think about the genetic code, there's four different letters, so I'm using this as an example to show. This gene has thousands of letters, and this testing company looks at one variant. Of the four genes that we know about, it looks for 24 variants out of thousands. So as few as 8% of people or percentage of cases with this condition would be detected with this test. So the vast majority would not be identified with this test. So this is not a good clinical test. If I had someone that I suspected had this condition, I would definitely not suggest that they get a direct-to-consumer test. But if I find this, I'm gonna wonder if it actually is real. And if it is real, that means that we can do something about it and we can treat it and we can potentially prevent heart disease. So it's really important information for those people that do get a positive result. But is it really positive? So I told you before that still a thousand of those one million calls might be wrong. And is this call right or is it not. This is not a clinical test. So every recreational genomic test that's not a clinical grade test should be repeated. And it should be repeated in the clinical lab. And that's for things like this. So this man got back a 23andMe result that said he was at very high risk of Alzheimer's disease. He went to his primary care provider, and that primary care provider was not able to help him because he didn't understand the testing, and referred him to someone else. In the meantime, as he was trying to get help, he, he went to the, uh, one of the other competitive companies and had it done, which said that he didn't have this result. And when he went to his insurance to ask if they would cover a clinical test, they said no. Anybody know why? Because he had no family history of this early onset condition that should have been seen in 50% of his family members. So he was stuck because his insurance wouldn't cover it. So he met with a genetic counselor, and that genetic counselor helped him get cost-affordable cost testing. And he was found not to have this condition. So it's important to know that false positives do happen, and they happen fairly commonly. And so for some conditions such as this, as well as other types of heart disease and other types of diseases that can be really significant, like the one I talked about, it's really important to know if this is real or not. And even if you have a result and you can get information, there's still a question about the applicability. A lot of these test results tell you to do things like we should normally do, like eat well, <laughs> don't smoke, exercise. So where are we going in the future? Because clearly there's limitations to some of these tests. So how about I just want to get my genome done? Can I just do that? Well, you can. This is my genome. I was number 335 of people that had access to the raw data of their full genomes. Those lightning strikes right there are things that I carry that I don't necessarily present with, but that I could pass on to my children if my children's partner also had it, could have that. All of these question marks, did you see those? That's all the question marks. <laughs> so the vast majority of my genome is question marks. So these are the different ways we classify the different changes in our genomes, and you can see we're still trying to figure out what all of these individual changes mean. So even if I can go to every single spot in my genome and see what genomic sequence is there, how to interpret remains a huge challenge for our field. And what does this impact have on people? Well, it can have a lot of different potential um, impacts. So this was a study that we did with a group of um, individuals here at the university that had their genomes um, sequenced, and we asked them some survey questions after they had went through the process. And many found it to be professionally very enlightening to understand what it was like to be on the patient side of getting a genetic test and what they had really struggled with. Some of people actually found medically actionable results. So an example is malignant hyperthermia. 
which is a condition where you would change the medications that you're giving when you're going under so that you don't get a very high temperature that can lead to death. Um, and so that individual was able to choose other medications when they went under, under surgery because of the variant that was found. But other people got concerning results. This is a good quote. Personally, I am angry at the types of results that were given. I was basically told that I have a high suspicion of having a condition for which I have never had symptoms. This is not useful. Additionally, in trying to find an MD to do an assessment of me to be sure that I do not have symptoms, I was told that they do not understand the testing and therefore would not see me. Not useful. So this is where I give my plug for genetic counselors. <laughs> So genetic counselors help people understand what their genetics mean to them, what their family history means for them. And how all, all of these things come together to help people manage their care and manage their future. So where are we at and where are we going? The genetic testing market spiked. And over the last year and a half, it's plateaued. There were huge layoffs in the industry in the last month. 6% um, of the workforce probably is estimated. And so what's happening? What's going on? There's been a lot of things that have happened over the last year and a half. And Bonnie is going to be walking you through some of the things that people think about when they go through this testing, some of the things that have come to light through people investing in this testing. And then I guess you could sum it up as ethical and legal issues. Okay. You're up. I get to talk about a lot of the challenges, and I think you can probably see some of them um, as Heather went through all the technology. So I just want to start by reminding there's a definition. Um, when you think about what is direct-to-consumer testing, it's on the NIH's website, the Genome Center's website. The important thing here, I think, to see here is that this direct-to-consumer testing is a business model that circumvents the medical system. That's what it's for, is to circumvent the medical system. One of the challenges with people in the medical system is as soon as somebody finds something, they send you to the medical system, who was never involved in the first place. And you can see the challenges with interpreting people's results when nobody knows what's going on. Um, so what is, what is, and I'm going to say genetic testing, and I'm really going to clarify this. I'm talking about direct-to-consumer genetic testing, because clinical testing, if you haven't figured out, is quite different. So as Heather showed you, well, you can find some normal variations in your genome, and there you go. Um, you can find some variants that actually are very highly associated with disease. And those are the things that people worry about, um, and those are the things where people make people go running to their physician. Um, we can find variants associated with disease traits. The utility of this might improve. Some of it's not really useful. Um, and the, po the potential for predicting best practices when it comes to medical treatment right now, limited, eh, not necessarily limited, but more um, uh, um, useful in, um, in pharmaceuticals, in figuring out what medication works for what person. Some of the direct-to-consumer testing does that, um, and some does not. Can it improve health? Can it preserve health? Well, I suppose if you eat well, don't smoke and exercise, yeah. So there you go. Um, so what does genetic testing not tell you? It doesn't tell you some of the stuff that people are really looking for, or think they're looking for. Like, how long are you going to live? I don't know if anybody wants to know that or not. That's sort of, you know, I want to know it if I'm going to live a long time, but not if I'm not, but then you're stuck. Um, you know. um, what your children are be like, there isn't anything that can tell you that at all. Anybody who has kids knows that. Um, what disorders you will definitely develop, with rare exception. On the scale of things, when we look at our genome and how it works and what we know about it, which is a whole lot, and what we don't know about it, which is a whole lot more, um, there are relatively few genes when changed or directly cause a disease in people all the time who have that gene change on the scale of things. So you can find something like that, but, but you probably won't. Or you'll have it in your family history and you'll know about it anyway. Um, what you can do to prevent disease. And here's another example. So as a matter of fact, there are genetic variants that make you very highly predisposed to lung cancer if you're a smoker. And you think, well, I don't know what, you shouldn't smoke no matter what, okay? But, so you find that, except 10 to 15 percent of lung cancer happens in people who never smoked in the first place. There are too many other factors. So if you found that you didn't have one of those variants, that doesn't mean you won't get lung cancer. You're still like, well, you're still there. 
Um, so one of the things that we find in genetic counseling is how people think about their genes. And I think this is hugely important. Um, so what, is, what, is, what do your genes mean to you if you're not a science person? Well, it means it's you. People think of their genes as themselves, and you see that all the time. It means your family, it means your identity, your children, your parents, who you are and where you came from. That's what the testing, as Heather showed you some of the advertising, that's what the advertising is, is banking on, is that you want to know more about you. Therefore, there's this underlying belief that your genes are you. Therefore, there's also this underlying belief that if something's wrong with their genes, there's something wrong with you. And people actually have a hard time when they find something's wrong with their genes. Um, it's your unique identifier. You can't change it. You can't fix it. It's why Gina happened. I'll tell you that in a minute if you don't know what that is. It's why people express concerns over genetic testing even though there's a federal law that addresses this. That, dis that addresses discrimination. It's why adoptees want to find their birth parents. Um, so adoptees, like many people, believe, know, believe knowing more about their family, their family history, who they came from will tell them more about themselves. And that's hugely important, again, because when something's wrong, that, that's big. Um, and it's why people feel obligated to do things for people they're related to, even if they don't like them. Um, and I'm sure everyone's been there. And it's personal, and it's life-changing. For most people, the information is incredibly personal, and this is another thing. Genetics means families. So when you test yourself, and those results come along, they mean something to other people in your family. It's different from other medical areas. So if you get into a car accident, that doesn't mean your brother's going to get into a car accident, unless, unless there's something else going on. But... Um, but if, as a matter of fact, if you have a gene that predisposes you to cancer, that does mean that your brother or your sister could have that gene. And now suddenly you're sitting on information that you're trying to figure out, should I share this with my family members or shouldn't I? And if you all sit there and think about your family, your immediate family, what would happen if you found out you had a gene that gave you a really high chance of getting a cancer? Would you call all your first degree relatives? And what would that look like? In many cases, not so good. Um, and, and we've had families struggle with this. We've had families think it's a great idea to do it at Christmas time. It's not. Um, that's a bad idea. But in some way, shape, or form, and we've had people, we've all had people um, in genetic counseling where somebody honestly says, I don't like my family anyway, I'm not telling them. And that happens. Um, and that's surprising, but it absolutely does. Families are um, fun. They're, they're unique, and family dynamics are unpredictable. So back to this, what is the personal impact of um, genetic information? So if you can't see the um, cartoon, it's a woman sitting there with um, her boyfriend, or one, the guy who wanted to be her fiancé, his genome in her purse. Um, and, and she's not willing to take the ring. So, you know, I thought that was an amazingly cute cartoon, and I'm going to show you some of the things here. So it does change how people see themselves. It changes how people, the plans people make. If you knew it, you were at a high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, early onset Alzheimer's disease, would you tell someone you were dating? Um, when? And, and what do you say? And if you're, someone told you that, would you stay with them? Would you marry them? Would you have kids? These are huge decisions. What career would you choose? If you're heading towards medical school and then a residency that's like seven years long, are you going to do that? Or are you going to change your whole life? And then what are you going to do? You have to do something. So all these questions people grapple with. Um, so why do people have direct-to-consumer testing? Well, just for fun. I'm sure everyone here who did it just went, that would be kind of fun. Um, it doesn't involve the healthcare system. As we all know, the healthcare system is complicated. It's sometimes hard to get an appointment, it's sometimes hard to get help. By the time you get your appointment and get there, you don't have what they were looking for in the first place. Um, the cost is not high, $100. Um, there's perceived control. It's my information and I can control it. And the fear of genetic discrimination. So what's genetic discrimination? Again, there's a definition for genetic discrimination on the uh, National Human Genome Center's website. And there it is. 
So in 2008, the Bush administration signed a federal law that um, is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA. And what this law does is it prevents two entities from discriminating against somebody on the basis of genetic information. And that word's huge. It doesn't say genetic testing, it says genetic information. So for example, if you had a family history with four first degree relatives who had breast cancer when they were 30, I don't need a test to tell you, to tell me that you're at high risk. You're, you're at high risk. Um, you should be tested by the way if that's anybody here, but I don't need a test to, to know that. So that's a huge word. Um, and so what this does is it covers insurance, health insurance, and it covers employment. So no employer can say you've got to have a genetic test in order to work here, nor can an employer find your genetic testing results and fire you because of it. Um, and health insurance, your pro health insurance companies are precluded from using genetic information from raising your rates or keeping you from getting health insurance. That sounds great, and it is. What it doesn't include is it doesn't cover life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care insurance. Mortgage, mortgage insurers and other commercial entities are not covered, and the mil military is not covered either. Um, so what about people who have a condition? This is people at risk, a gene, we're talking about a gene. So insurers, be, with the Affordable Care Act, insurance, insurers can no longer, insurers, sorry, can no longer discriminate on current disease states. So they can't say, you have this condition, we don't want you. Um, as we all know, the Affordable Care Act has been on unstable ground, and so whether or not that's going to stay that way is, is, of, is, is of concern to everybody in the healthcare system. So, but disability, long-term care, and life insurance currently can refuse or charge more for coverage if a person is affected with a condition. So it's not complete, and it still leaves people sort of out there. So I'm going back to where Heather started from, which is what can you learn? This is my 23andMe. I took some screenshots. You can see all kinds of things, most of which mean nothing to anybody. <clears throat> There's a lot of... Um, conditions for which um, people in the general population can carry a gene and they're fine and the only time you see the condition is when two carriers get together and both pass that gene on to the child. But there are some also remarkable conditions that are kind of scary like cancer um, and some neurological conditions that, that we actually worry about. So here's, this is mine. I'm a carrier of PKU, phenylketonuria. About one in 50 people in the population carry the gene for phenylketonuria. Carriers are fine. When two carriers get together, they've got a one in four chance of having a child with phenylketonuria. It's on the newborn screen test. All newborns are screened for phenylketonuria. It's, a, it's like it's the genetics poster child because it's a condition that actually can be treated and it can be treated with diet. So, you know, Along the lines of, if I were younger, thinking about having kids, I might want my husband screened. I don't know what we would do with the results if he was a carrier, but we'd know. We'd have a chance to know. Um, remember how Heather talked about that age-related macular degeneration in 60% of the population? I'm one of them. So there were, I have two variants. I took the SNPs that they were looking at, put them into a database, pulled the papers, and it was pretty amazing. Heather showed you what, um, what uh, 23andMe tells you about it as far as frequency is concerned, and when you really drill down, you find out, really, I've got a 1% extra chance of getting this? Do I care? Um, all of all the things that can happen to me, really? Um, but I looked at this, and, I, and it was actually even worse, because I pulled the papers, and some of the papers have like an N of three, one of the papers was actually talking about some other condition that's somewhat related to this and looked like this, and I'm like, really? So it, it, um, it's hard to tell where the information's coming from. It's hard to tell how much of a risk. It's not clear. You really have to be able to drill through the website and understand and understand relative risk in order to get an idea of, uh, this is not something I really care about. And here's the other thing. So if I say I don't care about this, the truth is a whole lot of people, two to three percent of the population, which I think is about right, I'm looking at Heather, um, for macular degeneration, that's, it's not an uncommon disease. So if I get it, is it because of this or just because? 
because it's so common. And they've picked common diseases, as Heather said, that makes it likely they're going to hit on them. So what are some of the other major concerns? Privacy. So going back to the last slide that Heather showed, which showed that the, the companies are peaking, they, they, did ex they were exploding. They had a huge market share. Um, but they're starting to lay people off. Why is that? Well, there's some thoughts that perhaps the issues of privacy, the concern about privacy, um, has, has hit the general population and people are like, maybe I don't want to do this because I don't trust this. The other, the other thought is the early adopters who have $100 and think this looks like fun, they, they did it. They're already there. And the other people are like, yeah, it didn't work for them very well, so I'm not spending my $100 on this. And that either way could be true. It's not really clear why this is happening. There are other things that could be happening as well. But the most important thing is, and I had one headline, I don't think I have it in my slides, from one of the papers that said privacy is dead. Um, and it probably is. In the age of computers, you can't protect anybody's privacy for anything. Remember Equifax? So, you know, if something's in a database, it can get out. Um, the other thing about these companies, and you saw, is that one of the ways that they do the work is they do the genetic testing and compare it to other people in the database, and then you populate the database with information. So you, if anybody has done this, you keep getting emails saying, you know, how much, how much sleep do you get? Do you have trouble sleeping? What do you eat? Um, have you had a heart attack? Um, have you had any cancers? Anybody in your family? So you're populating their database with information that they're then using. Um, so the information that they have is only as good as the information that they get. Um, so the other question is these tests cost $100. How do you run a genetic testing lab when a test only costs $100? Well, there are some ways you can sell your database, and they do. Um, and Heather and I were just talking, I think I emailed her, because I started getting these emails from my heritage, um, and I said, I didn't do that. I sent it to 23andMe, but I didn't do my heritage. What happened? And she said, oh, my heritage bought Promethease, so then that's how they got the database, and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so databases move around, privacy is not um, protected totally. Up to 60% of European Americans can be identified through one of these databases, whether you've put DNA in them or not. So you can be found through your relatives. So you can blame it on them. So who does this affect? Sperm donors? Egg donors? Criminals? There's all kinds of ways that this can be used if you can identify people in this population. And I'm going to go back one other step having to do with ancestry and also other things in, this, in these databases is the majority of people in these databases are European Americans. So this, these databases are limited in the information that they have because we don't have the world's population in these databases. Um, this wasn't a direct-to-consumer test, but we did, did decide to put it up here because one of the things that gets mixed up is direct-to-consumer test and clinical testing as well. Sort of was a mix of both. And this has actually happened in our family. So my husband's sister called. She lives in Florida and she's retired. And she said, I got, I got this letter saying that, you know, I should have breast cancer testing. It was particularly important because she had had breast cancer. She was a survivor. Um, now, if you're going to target people who are in their 80s, how many women get breast cancer? A lot. It's a common condition. So you're probably going to hit on a lot of women who had breast cancer. They're going to look at this going, I should have genetic testing for breast cancer because then I can tell my children that they're at a higher risk or not at a higher risk. That's what the letter said. Fortunately, she called us and our first answer was, what? Where'd that letter come from? And we never figured it out. So we said, well, if we can't figure it out, just don't do that. Well, as it turns out, there was a testing company sending these letters out to people who said, okay, free genetic testing for breast cancer, I'll do this. And they did it. They billed Medicare. Patients didn't even know that this was happening. And this, is, this was a $2.1 billion Medicare fraud, one of the biggest Medicare frauds. Um, 
uh, you would think a, a physician would have to order the test. There was a physician, one, ordering all the tests. Um, so, you know, the not understanding what clinical testing is versus direct-to-consumer testing versus what can be told and who should be ordering them and under what circumstances leaves, this op leaves people open for, for these, um, these transgressions. Inconsistency in interpretation. Heather talked a little bit about this. Um, this is one study. It wasn't a big one, but it was concerning because Ambry Genetics does a lot of clinical testing, does a whole lot of our clinical testing. And so when they found that up to 40% of the calls for cancer from a direct-to-consumer company were wrong, that's big. That's really big. So if you thought you were at a high risk for cancer, you would be very scared. Or if you thought you weren't at risk, you'd go, yay, <laughs> but... Not necessarily true. Ancestry testing, we talked a little bit about it. It's a little bit different. The thing that everybody needs to know about ancestry testing is it's parentage testing. So ancestry testing works because they want you to gather your whole family together at Christmas time. And everybody spits in a tube and sends it off. And, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> you find out Relatives you didn't even know, and you got to feed them now. Um, <laughs> Christmas time. So, this one I was. I, this one came across um, in my email, and I and, it, and I looked it up, and it's a, it's a true story. So, it's it's not funny, but it, it is interesting um, in that this person was a research geneticist, and he thought, "I'll give my parents ancestry testing for Christmas," and he did. And, the, and what, the, what the testing, for those of you who haven't done it, not only does it tell you um, where you're likely to, where your ancestors were likely originated, is it tries to connect you with people who are related to you. So it actually says you share 50% of your genes in common with, you know, Susan Smith over here. Do you want, do you want to call her? Um, and if you don't do that, it, you can't really get any answers because that's what it's based on, is trying to compare your DNA to people in the database. Well, his dad got a call from a guy that said, we share 50% of our DNA, I'm your son. And he was, um, and he sort of fit in the middle. In other words, he showed up while dad was still married to mom, you know? So anyway, mom left and <laughs> And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't a Merry Christmas. And there are stories like this all over the place having to do with the ancestry. This is parentage testing. And that's not all that clear. And it connects you to people that maybe you didn't know about. So I did 23andMe and I just looked and went, oh, my cousin's in there. So I called my cousin and she goes, who's this? And I said, I don't know. She goes, do you want to call him? I'm like, I'm not calling him. So <laughs> I don't know who that person is. Probably they are related to us, but I mean, they are related, but probably it's somebody whose last name has changed and I just haven't followed it. But who knows? You can find out all kinds of things. So what happens to your data? Well, it turn, turns out 23andMe and Glaxo, SmithKline have, um, have a, a, an alliance and databases are sold. Now, in a, in a big picture way for the whole world, this is actually a good thing because the 23andMe has a massive database. And if, uh, if, a t if a pharmaceutical company can get their hands on a massive database, they can find out for all of us what drugs work better for what condition. We all know that if you take 10 people that have the same thing, you give them all the same drug, a third get better, a third get worse, and a third stay the same, about. Um, there are adverse events that happen with drugs, and they're big, they make people really sick. Um, so if we could figure that out, that would be great. But in the meantime, if you don't want your data sold, it might not be so clear to you that your data has been sold. And then there's the Golden State Killer, which who um, um, started the question of who has access to my data? Do law, does law enforcement, did I ever say that was okay? Do I have to say it's okay? Um, do, we, do we care? I mean, we caught somebody who, who's a murderer. Isn't that a good thing? But do you want your DNA used for that? Do you want a say in this? 
Now I'm just going to go down the road for just a minute and then I'm going to give you some time for questions about recreational, real recreational testing, just to show you what's out there. Um, and, and to tell you that the reason why I have a hard time with this kind of testing, not just not the 23andMe for health, as well as ancestry, is that it actually makes it look like genetic testing is kind of can be used for silly stuff. When in fact, we know in clinical testing, it has changed lives. It's, it's saved lives. It's saved people who are at risk for heart disease. It's saved people who are at risk for cancer. Um, it's done a lot. But when you start looking at um, what actually is out there, you can use your DNA for all kinds of things, sorta. You can find a mate. It'll tell you. And the thing I like about this, what was this? So you go from here's a very bad person to be with, to give it a try, <laughs> to a good person, to an excellent person, based on your DNA. As Heather said, that might not be a good thing. Um, you can give your DNA away and it'll tell you what kind of wine to drink, or you could just drink it. <laughs> um, paternity testing through the mail. How's that gonna work? I just wanna be in the room when everybody has this discussion about why they're doing this. Uh, um, Vitagene, athletics. It'll tell you what vitamins you need to be an athlete and it'll sell you the vitamins as well. Athletagene will tell you something. I'm not quite sure what. This is the one that will tell you if you're like an elite athlete I'm going to show you my results. <laughs> and pets. And I just put this in here because the pet industry is huge. Um, and this can actually, you know, going back to what can make a difference, it can make a difference if you're a breeder and you know what genes might actually predispose a purebred animal to a disease. It, so that could make a difference. Most people do it for fun. So here's my 23andMe, and I am so surprised. It says, uh, my muscle composition is uncommon in elite athletes. <laughs> I'm shocked. I really thought I'd be fine. <laughs> you know, I was just ready to take up running. Not. So, summary. Let me just go through these. Um, genetic testing is evolving. I'm, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's all bad. It isn't. The potential is huge. The potential is there to flip healthcare around. And instead of waiting for people to get sick and then trying to take care of them, figuring out who's going to get sick and keeping them from getting sick. That's the potential. We're just not there yet. In the meantime, it's difficult to figure out what's worthwhile and what's not worthwhile. Um, interpretation and predict prediction right now is not all that clear and it's complicated. Sequencing a whole genome is possible, but it's limited in its utility because there's a whole lot we know, but there's a whole lot we don't know. Um, hope for future precision, precision medicine and management is there. And here's my plug for genetic counselors. This is what we do. So if you get results and you want them interpreted, um, you should be able to get some information from a genetic counselor and we're here to help you. And that's pretty much it. I think the, oh, and this one goes to Tom, but let me uh, take questions. Yeah, Heather. So given all of this, if, if somebody ever asked you, are there any direct to consumer testing kits uh, that I could use that would give me some helpful medical information about my health. Would you recommend any of the direct-to-consumer testing? Go ahead, no, go. Okay, okay. Go yeah, there are some. So the, as we saw, the direct-to-consumer space is evolving. So I recommended to a friend who really wanted to get testing done for no reason other than she cares about her health. And I won't give the specific company a, a plug, but they do exist. And they target about 50 to 60 genes predominantly breast cancer and cardiovascular and things that are preventable and there is medical management to address those and guidelines around them. And we know a lot about those genes. Um, so it still led her because she had had a specific type of cancer. They still tried to sell her more than what she might have needed. And so I just, it's just to be aware of, like there are some, it's still a company, they're still gonna try to make money, but there is some really good testing that's clinical grade that's out there that is direct to consumer. Um, 
but I just won't give the plug for one specific company in. But you wouldn't know the names of those companies. I'll just add that. Like, they're not common ones that people know. So I'm confused about how they do this Neanderthal DNA. There's just a publication out now that says we all have Neanderthal DNA. What, what is Neanderthal DNA if we all have it? And how do they you know, do that percentage? And I am like not that? in the ancient DNA space, but I can kind of speak to it. OK. <laughs> yeah, does somebody else from the faculty want to give this one a shot? OK, so just like you can track your own heritage back, you can actually use specimens from back then that have certain patterns. So you can actually do a comparison to that. Um, I always never want to know those ones because I'm afraid like it says like you're more hairy or something. That's all I really know about it. <laughs> this is like the perfect transition to the March 5th. So the Neanderthals and the Denisovans migrated hundreds of thousands of years earlier out of Africa than modern humans did. And they had a chance to adapt to the various uh, parasites and diseases that were common in non-equatorial and sub-tropical Africa, so that when later generations of humans migrated out of Africa and mated with Neanderthals and Denisovans, they actually had an advantage in resisting diseases. And so if you do the math, it only takes about 200 years to dilute genes down to about 1%, assuming random mating. 200 years. The last Neanderthal walked the Earth 40,000 years ago. So these genes that we inherited from Neanderthals and Denisovans clearly gave us an advantage in today's world. Well, maybe not against coronavirus, but <laughs> against certain other viruses. Thank you. Thanks. So yeah, it's a good thing to be Neanderthal, First I suppose. Place. First place. First place out of one. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had a quick question in regards to results that come in. So the results over, overall can change over time with more and more correct. people getting tested, correct? Correct. So then um, both an environment also, right? Because if we are getting exposed to different environments at different time, or is there too little bit of a time window with that in so, our specific life? So, so you're right. So um, anybody who's done 23andMe or any of these, you look and, and it gets updated. So what's a variant of unknown significance, which is one of the results you can get, like we found something, um, we don't know if it causes something or not, sometimes gets reclassified with more information. Um, what we know about a condition and what we know about what genes actually um, play a role in a certain conditions change over time in that way. So you will, your results will change. Um, and uh, in one other test that I did, I was a carrier for four conditions, and then I opened my iPad that had my genome on it, and I was a carrier for three. One went away. Um, it didn't go away. Just the way they interpreted those results changed. So yeah. Can I speak to the environmental yeah. piece? Yeah, so currently what we have available when we think about environmental, I'm just going to use breast cancer as an example, is you can use, for instance, calculators that look at hormone use and that look at, you know, your first menstrual cycle, various different um, factors that we know that contribute to breast cancer risk, as well as your genes, and you can combine those and you can, we, you can create what are called polygenic risk scores. Um, and so you're using many genes as well as environmental factors. Uh, and that's what they're trying to do with that diabetes example that I showed you. But um, there's a lot of debate, and this would be a great leading edge for a couple of years from now, um, about this, is how do we combine all of this information in a way that's actually useful? Mm -hmm. um, so we're there a little bit, but there's a lot more research that needs to be done in that space. And for instance, we know a lot about family history. Family history is your first and probably best quote unquote genetic test, and a lot I'd say all of these companies are not including that in their assessments. And so that's a huge loss to not have that information included because it's not, it's not giving people accurate results. My diabetes results I've done with my family history are completely off from 23andMe. Okay. Uh, Prometheus uh, cites uh, all sorts of uh, peer-reviewed journals right. uh, when they uh, evaluate your 
genome data. Is there any validity to that? So Prometheus is the company that was purchased by MyHeritage. So if you did Prometheus, you're starting to get emails from MyHeritage. Um, what Prometheus did and how, so if you remember back um, a while ago, the FDA shut down 23andMe because they said they were issuing health information and they weren't a health company and they weren't following all the rules that clinical labs have to follow so they can't do it. And then they finally said, you know what, we can do all of that, and they did. Um, and that, and that, that's limited in what it means, but, but I can say more about that in a minute. Prometheus was never targeted because Prometheus never did that. All it said is, here's a variant you have, and here's all the papers that, that, call, that say something about that variant. And if you look, some of those papers will have one person. Some of those papers will have a population. So they, they didn't try and quantify or qualify the information. And for anybody else who hasn't done Prometheus, literally, <laughs> I was actually, it's kind of funny, because um, your results come, and I'm not kidding, it comes under a header called the good news. <laughs> and then it shows all the stuff that's good, and then it's got another header going, the bad news. And if you look, some of the, there was, you're at a higher risk for heart disease because of this, and that's under the bad news. Under the good news is, you're at a lower risk for heart disease because I'm like, see, so it was up to you to figure out how to interpret the data. So they did not interpret, they just showed you, all they did was connect publications to it. They didn't try and quantify a risk. Yeah, and because it, and and because it wasn't vetted, yeah. it was almost like the Wikipedia where you can go in and kind of change things. Yeah. So it, it started off that way. So. Um, it was really hard, and I think more people struggled with it for the Bonnie's exact point is they never c accumulated it, and so it really was very random. And it also would use terminology that I, I think was, in my opinion, somewhat offensive. Um, they would use words about mental health that we wouldn't use in terminology again because you're pulling it from different spaces. So you have to be really, it was very, I was very cautious with how I would have thought about it. It was also a third party. And for instance, I did not consent for them to keep my DNA, and they kept my DNA. They sold it. They sold it. So, um, so again, that's a third party that I put my DNA into to use as a teaching tool, to be honest. And I specifically asked for it to be destroyed within five days, and it wasn't. And my information was disclosed to potential relatives. So I always used to think, well, it's fairly protected. And now I feel as though actually it's very much not protected. Hi, um, I kind of wanted to go back to a point that was made, sorry, at the very beginning of the lecture about just different geographical areas that you can find that your ancestors come from. Um, I guess first of all, thinking about how like people have shifted over time, how accurate is it even when people say like, I'm 2% like Chinese or something like that. And I'm wondering if their impacts, and perhaps this is more just like within like diversity and equity and not so much in genetics, that um, spreading like these really small percentage of different like racial ancestries um, has on just the general population and um, where we're moving. So, so you're right. Um, the information that comes out is as, um, <clears throat> as accurate as the database is. So if there are people missing from the database, there's information missing from the database, and there are a lot of people missing from the database. Um, and, and so it's comparative there, which is why you can send your spit to 23andMe and get one result, and send your spit to Ancestry and they'll tell you something else. The, the, other, the other thing is, you know, over time, I'm not, sometimes I'm not sure what a lot of it means, because over time people moved a lot. Um, and I know from um, personal experience, because our daughter is adopted from China and she wanted to try this, and I'm like, okay. Um, what I found out, from calling the companies is that some countries will not let biological specimens outside of the country. So there's a whole population of people around the world that aren't in these databases that really skew what you see. Um, and so you ha you're right, it's, you have to be careful with those, with the results. Yeah, and I have people ask me, why do people care about these arbitrary lines that we've created in history? Mm -hmm. Why does that matter? Um, I've also had friends say, I am African American and I want to know where my relatives are from. I want to know their journey. 
I want to know how this affected my past and how it leads to where I am today. So when we think about, like Bonnie said, identity, why we have these social constructs, how they impact people in their lives, um, and how they impact families, because that was important to my friend, but it wasn't important to his mother, and his mother took great offense that he would want to go on a journey to try to un understand his ancestors. So the personal nature and how this has global societal effects, I think is not one, and I appreciate people bringing it up, so thank you, and um, also making us think about why that's important or not important. Uh, hi, good talk. Uh, quick question, so is the book closed on SNPs, or are these companies which may be kind of collecting more DNA than anyone else in history, are they making an effort to go deeper than the already known areas of uh, polymorphisms, or are they taking an effort to look for additional areas of uh, polymorphisms with their data sets? Thanks. Depends on the company. Um, yeah, I would say we always think SNPs are dead. We're like, yeah, GWAS studies, which are genome-wide association studies that had SNPs, we're like, oh, they didn't really, they told us a little bit, but not too much. And then all of a sudden there's a huge new study that comes out that teaches us a lot about different like biological pathways and how they're all connected and how things that we thought were discordant weren't or, um, so I don't, I, I never second guess SNPs in the types of information, but they give us different information and it's more complex. Like how do we bring these SNPs together with the environment? Like the other question and how do we bring together the self-reported data from these huge databases, which is actually really important. I mean, some of these companies, like Bonnie was just saying, have amazing research that we could never get unless we had this many people and this many people self-reporting. Um, and so it's tough, but then you also have places like the United Kingdom that has this amazing health record system and genomic data, and how do we use those? Because those actually might tell us more about that prediction and thinking about the future. So. I think all genetic information is going to be important, and it just tells us different things with the different studies we can do with it. You guys referenced this early on. You go get a result like this. You go see your doctor. And he doesn't have a clue what to do. Right. So asking a question from the primary care doc's perspective, we've got the good news. We've got the bad news. We've got all the false, false positive issues, all the false negative issues, but the patient's in front of you. Are we wasting your guys' time by sending all these false positives, all these false negatives? You're gonna be taking a lot of patients who you're gonna be going, you know, no. Just, yeah. don't, just don't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the question of the year. Like, that's a million dollar question. So um, for those of you who know genetic counseling, genetic counseling in what we know and what we're able to tell people and do for people has exploded. Um, there are, there's a shortage of genetic counselors, um, which in, in a way is good, but it, you know, for the profession, it's really kind of neat. If you're a student, it's great. Um, but, but if you're a patient trying to find help, it may not be so great. Um, and within, within the community and within the whole healthcare community, within physicians, the community of physicians, is a question of, you know, this wasn't a medical test. What's my role in this? My role should be in, you know, medical tests. But by the same token, you're sitting there with someone looking at you going, but this says I'm going to get cancer. Is it real? Um, and I, I, we don't have a good answer for that other than... Um, hopefully, as a genetic counseling community, we can educate as many people in the public and primary care providers about at least what, what might mean something and what might not mean something. Um, the hardest thing in, with the genetic tests is, is less of when you find something. When you find something, usually a physician will pay attention to it. It's like, I don't know if that's real or not, but we're going to try it again with, in, a, in a clinical test. It's when you don't find something, when you think something should be there, did they miss it? Um, and then what do I do? And is this person gonna get cancer and we didn't see that coming? Um, and, and that's huge. So the, the workforce, both in the primary care world as well as in the genetic counseling world is huge. This has the potential to overwhelm the healthcare system with questions um, that, that are difficult to answer and change over time. 
The, the, and, and as Heather said, I think one of the things that's huge is these results change over time and they change from person to person. And diabetes was a perfect example of that in that I got my diabetes risk scored. Nobody took my family history in, in the testing company. No one asked me if I had a family history of it, and I do. I've got four, four, four people in my family who have type 2 diabetes. Um, but they told me my risk was really low. I don't buy it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what those testing results really mean, but those are the kinds of things that as, as, your health, as a healthcare provider, you put them all together, that takes time. And um, you're right, this has the potential to overwhelm the healthcare system. Can I say something yeah. about that? Okay, so on my role as the board of directors for the National Society of Genetic Counselors, we think about that. Um, we think about how we engage with our collaborators and partners in the healthcare system. And so one of the things that we're working on is developing a tool that allows us to figure out um, how to help um, primary care providers triage, and to Bonnie's point, what's significant, what's not significant, and what makes the most sense so that we're not overwhelming the system with um, requests that are probably not as um, helpful, and then also really helping people understand who are the people that I should be flagging that might not even be coming to me, but that I'm seeing as my patients, but that need this regardless. So there are some kind of red flags, and those have been used in, say, cancer clinics and cardio clinics. But in primary care, I think we can do a better job of working together, genetics and primary care, to really figure out how to work and do this together in a way that's not, that's not taking a lot of time, not taking a lot of resources, and gets the people that need it those resources. That said, there's also companies, because this is a need, that have also erupted that are there to provide telegenetic counseling services to people that want that information. So an easy button is to say, hey, I know this company that you can go and talk to to answer a question. And it's, not, it's an easy button, but it's also a real clinical um, service that's provided to these people that do have questions. And usually it's, what are your three main questions that you have about your result? Because we can't talk about everything. Um, so that's usually what I say to, to individuals if they come and they have those types of questions. Thank you very much. So they, they already put up the other slide that we wanted to show and make sure that um, people write down the dates and we hope certainly to see you all there. Thanks again for all of you coming out tonight and um, again thanks to Heather and Bonnie.